All right. Tell me when to go. You may start. Hello, and welcome back to the Fruitalicious Flavor of So You Think You Can Fan In. The only podcast where I am doubting if I've used that one before. How you doing tonight, guys? I'm doing pretty good. I don't know how I'll be doing tonight, because it's currently 1 p.m., but this afternoon I'm doing fine. That's fair. Today, so, I, wanna, I am I wanna... here again. Matt. Oh. Fucking interrupt me again. See what happens, you little cunt. <laughs> Finish your sentence. So this week uh, is going to be a bonus episode. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be airing in December or if we're going to hold it. But either way, t what we have today uh, goes off the theming of what we have for December, which is with stuff that we've written. As, you, as you, If you've seen last episode, if you can hear me over my dog scratching at my door, then you should know that we are doing right now is writing bad fan fictions and giving it to each other. And this is kind of on that topic, only instead of bad fan fictions, it's, what would you, how would you describe it? Fan fiction campaigns? Um, Not specifically as a, as fan fiction, but taking an existing media that everybody likes, like say, Star Wars, and running a campaign in it. Yes, which is, which I, I would say, I guess what could that could be our first topic. Would you consider no. that to be a fan fiction? I I because would I it would is technically I would say by definition of a fan fiction it is a fan written piece of fiction. Yeah, I would I would say someone's SW five V campaign or anything that's of an existing franchise is a fan fiction. Uh huh. I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure if 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 I wrote one of our sessions into a story and posted it, it would be a fan fiction. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I have to agree. It's it's basically just a different kind of fan fiction where a bunch of people get together and incorporate it together. Un unless Wizards of the Coast officially sponsors you and then you become... Then you become canon. canon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's talk about what we've done in that realm of campaign. So we'll start with uh, Mr. Hunter Bermudez. Yes. Johnson. Um, so what I was, what, 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 what I was thinking was I'm, I, w I guess I, I, uh, we could go about explaining our processes for adaptation, I guess, of how we go uh -huh. about interfering with the source material. Uh -huh. But what have you? Which, what have you? What have you worked on? Uh, so, yes, which hard. intellectual properties have you incorporated? So, um, we have my uh, my uh, very first uh, D and D campaign I've ever DM'd. Uh, the currently ongoing um, Super Sentai campaign, um, primarily um, adapting from uh, Super Sentai and Power Rangers, um, as well as. Uh, common writer for um special guest cameo appearances and then my and that one is a uh completely homebrewed uh dnd &D, um campaign for 5e and with some changes yeah with some changes and then because uh, I, I like to i like to take bits and pieces from other uh systems and then star wars 5e is an old republic campaign um using the star wars 5e uh tabletop conversion shout out to that conversion the guy i'm pretty sure like one guy works on it and he pretty much releases something new for it every thursday and also it's a really good conversion for 5e that's completely star wars and has how many would you say uh over a hundred races yeah um a bunch of classes a bunch of backgrounds it's pretty well made Yep. So I can attest to it as I've never seen it in action. That's true. Would we like to? Would you like to explain what you've worked on, Mister Rock Decocty? Well, my uh, my campaign that takes place inside of an existing property is actually in Monster Hunter, and it is based on a prequel. Hold on, my parents are talking. Okay. 
I will I will expl I will explain what mine is while your parents continue to talk then. If if that's cool with you. No, I'm good now. Oh, okay. I told them to stop yelling in the other room. Hey, yo, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Come on, Mom. I'm every talking time, about fan fiction. Every time they're like five feet away from each other and they're talking like 30% louder than anybody needs to. But anyway, <laughs> in my campaign, it takes place as a prequel to the entire Monster Hunter franchise. And it does so without a Monster Hunting Guild. So I had my players create the first Monster Hunting Guild in the entire universe of Monster Hunter. And it's also incorporating some other elements from uh, other things going on. Sergio neglected to mention this, but in his campaign, he had something called the Crisis, which is a weird giant convergence of all the campaigns we've run so far, of all the D&D varieties, both fan-made and not. And... That, uh, that, that incorporates a fair bit in the, in the story of mine. But the basic idea is it was actually an idea that I'd had for some time as, as a fan fiction for Monster Hunter. And I thought, well, that'd be a pretty great way for players to get some stuff rolling. Because they would be in charge of the of the guilds and all that. It's been and interesting going and, and so far. And that spawned many a meme. Oh, that. yes. Oh, yes. It absolutely has. But you, uh, I, yeah. Mr. Chudley himself, you have a you have a few under your belt. As I well. do. I have a. I'm currently actively working on a 40k Wrath and Glory campaign. Which, if you don't know what Wrath and Glory is, it's the most recent 40k role playing uh, system. I'm also passively working on a, a Percy Jackson inspired campaign. I haven't worked on it actively in a while because uh my brain has been spread very thin from school and uh now work but since school is you know getting to the point where it's over i can probably start working on it but i, I worked on that for a while um i had a i had it planned a decent amount in advance um i worked on a few others too that didn't really come to fruition but that's okay but even outside of that, um, we have not even us working on it. We we have also been a part of a few campaigns that have not been strictly D and D and have been inspired by other franchises. For example, we are in a uh, Titanfall two campaign right now, ran by our friend Nick, who is also running a Halo campaign that we are also a part of. One is on hiatus. We don't One we don't run like eight kind different of campaigns hiatus. concurrently. Don't worry, we're That's not that debatable. Insane. No, no, we just have, we <laughs> just have like sixteen different campaigns all merged in, in, into one at the moment. Into yeah. one, yeah. <laughs> one one cohesive universe and plot. Ah. Uh, anyhow, that's the that's the general gist of the fan stuff we've done. Should we talk about the uh, the nuances that we've discovered in running those campaigns? Well, I, I'm, I'm more, I'm more or less. Um, the first thing I wanted to discuss, as I mentioned before, was the process of adapting these worlds. That uh, that's like, true. Like, that's like, a good one to... because you've done Star Wars, but I've done Greek mythology, and that those are two mm -hmm. surprisingly similar but very different methodologies of studying. So I, I'll, mm. I'll go first with my Star Wars campaign because it's a, it's a little less involved than the, 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 the Sentai campaign in terms of like what I had to create. So, my mentality for the Star Wars campaign um, uh, was, obviously, I have the choice of setting it in canon and legends. And as Matt and Jake both know, I am a huge Star Wars Legends fan, and that's my preferred universe, so that's the one I picked. Then I had to decide on a timeline uh, to use, and I figured, what, what, be what better a timeline to give everybody, like, like, basically free will to do whatever you want than the Old Republic. Because, you know, if, if I said it during the Rebellion era, then, like, if you want to be a Sith, you got to be, like, an Inquisitor. Like, if you want to be a Jedi, you got to do, like, the whole you survived Order 66 thing. If I just said it during the Old Republic, then, you know, you can go to the Jedi Academy, you can go to the Sith Academy. Like, everything is free game. There's no restriction in character creation. 
So I, I settled on the Old Republic, specifically the time of the MMO, because, again, it's more free. If I did KOTOR 1 or KOTOR 2, there would be other strict limitations on character selection. Um, and I tried my best to adhere to, to canon. It, well, I wanted I wanted the, the campaign that I was doing to fit into the existing um, timeline in, in universe. I didn't want to... I am doing my own thing, but I didn't want to, like... Because I'm not, I'm not a believer in breaking canon. I like keeping everything the way it is. So I just, you know, worked my way around things. And so I could use, like, you know, the existing dates and stuff to, you know, put things together. Like, a convergence point that I used um, for, like, everybody's story was the sacking of the Jedi Temple from the very first Old Republic trailer. I think it's called Deceived. Um, where Darth Malgus lays siege to the temple. I gotta run downstairs real quick. Keep talking. All right, so we got our setting, we got our time. Uh, from there, you know, I let everybody do their um, characters. And then once they gave, because I, I feel like they the, the way I do it is give, you give me your characters and then I build the story around it. At least that's how I did it for the Star Wars campaign. And one of the things that I wanted to keep in line is I believe that when adapting a, a work you should make it really feel like you like you got to really feel like you're in the work and since i picked the old republic i wanted it to feel like a bioware game so for my very first session i wrote three different paths republic empire and neutral and of course i would um i also had light side and dark side choices for those who were sith and <laughs> jedi um and i would kind of not, not not go like you have a choice this or this i would kind of like allude to choices i wouldn't say like what's what's the bad choice what's the good choice it's like there are three people across the room which one do you go to and you talk to each one and you have to make a decision i also went with going republic empire and neutral because you you could still side with the empire and make light light decisions or dark decisions right if, if, if I had just said, oh, this is the light side choice, this is the dark side choice, this is a neutral choice, and we've got non-Jedi, Jedi, and Sith in the party, they, they obviously have different different things, you, like, you have to, like, different agendas. They have conflicting goals. Yeah, yeah, they have conflicting goals, but they're they're in a party together, so you so, so they kind of have to work around that. So, um, you know, they, they'd go down a path, and then from, from that session, I would continue to build along the path that they were going down to, but also give them the option to switch. Um, one, uh, one, one of the, the first story arcs that I did um, at the end, because uh, the, the, whole, the whole thing was that the Republic and the Empire were trying to get hold of this bomb, and the neutral option was to get a piece of Jake's character's Mandalorian armor. And at the end of the thing, um, they confront a, a Jedi Master uh, who had been uh, trying to get the bomb because the the Republic want the bomb to bomb the Sith, and the Sith don't want them don't want to get bombed. <laughs> obviously, don't want to get bombed. Yeah, and um, I think J Jake had the choice of letting the J Jedi Master keep the bomb, but everyone else um, kind of intervened and they got the bomb away from the Jedi Master, and Jake was forced to go uh, not be able to take um, the Jedi path just yet. Um, for that, because I was in a um, uh, I was in a mat. We were in a Mass Effect campaign, which you know is another Bioware property. And my one problem with the way the the guy was handling it, as much as I I, I like him as a DM, is that it didn't it didn't feel enough like a Bioware game. Because despite the Mass Effect system having a Paragon of Renegade choices, I never felt like I was making any Paragon and Renegade choices. Oh yeah, we were in that. Yeah, we were. I should have mentioned that one. We also were. He was busy at that point, so we can't, I can't really fault him because he was working 31,000 hours a week at McDonald's while he was writing in it. There was also a door that uh, that kept everybody's attention. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, the door. The door of legend. So the, the door the door of legend, which is another thing that I, uh, when I when writing the Star Wars campaign to General Cam, I made this joke so many times. But basically, there was this door that we couldn't get open. And... Well, I, I I believe the only thing we had to actually do was open, like, turn the handle. But we were told that it was locked, 
and we couldn't get in it. Uh huh. We were like, we tried to open the door, and he was like, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't so I work. Was, I, I want to explain. My character was a mentally retarded Krogan that had severe brain damage because a large chunk of his head was shot off, and was so he just had a big hollow hole in his head. And Sergio was my brother, and kind of my caretaker. And so we were, they were stuck in a room, and I think Sergio was in there and I wasn't. So I was like, I need to get in this room. So I started, like, punching the door because I was a Krogan battle master that was, like, entirely melee focused. I literally pretty much can't shoot, couldn't shoot a gun at all, but I could hit, like, a car. So I just start hitting the door. And I'm, he's like, you're taking damage for hitting the door. And I'm like, I need to get through the door. And he's like... You, why don't you try the handle? And I was like, I, I'm pretty sure my exact words when he said that was, are you fucking kidding me? It was all of our words. It was funny, but it was also like, bruh, you know? Well, it wasn't, it was funny, but also a complete waste of time. We spent like a good 25 minutes at that door. That's true. And if Alex does ever listen to the podcast, I just wanted to let him know. The problem fuck isn't you. that it wasn't fun. No, no, the, the, no. If Alex ever listened to this campaign, fuck you. <laughs> Go back to work. We spent 25 minutes on doing nothing. And I think I mean, we've talked to him about it. So it's not like it's a surprise that we're, we're still mad about the door. Well, I'm not mad. I just find it funny now. I'm not mad. Just disappointed. But um, that is that is a good thing. Do you mind if I segue into my own point, or do you want to keep going? Uh, I'm just I'm just um, I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm I'm just gonna end my my thing of uh, when it comes when it comes to adapting Star Wars is in my mind why I like it so much as a universe and why it works so well in the D and D is that um well obviously I believe as I've mentioned before player choice is a very is a very important thing at least in my mind for making a Star Wars RPG campaign basing it off of the Bioware games because. My, my rule for D and D is I want it to feel like the the property is based off of. But the reason why I like it so much is that the universe is so expansive. There's so many different times you can set it in, um, so many different options to choose, and the gal the galaxy is a really big place, so it really works for a D and D campaign because you can have the the general time period you're in as a backdrop, but you can you can just have your guys doing things that don't have anything to do with uh you know, the larger things. I think a lot of the problems with sci-fi worlds in general is that they make the galaxy feel a little too small. All of the main characters are, like, at the, like, you know, the crux in the important battles all the time. You know, a, a lot of people complain, like, oh, why wasn't Ahsoka in the original trilogy? Galaxy's a big place. The, the war is being fought on, like, a thousand different fronts. Your favorite extended universe character is probably on one of them. They they don't have to be chilling with the main characters at the specified lin linear path that main characters take in a in a war. Especially now that we know that Ahsoka was in the, the outer rim doing you doing know stuff. Chum bucket stuff. And yeah, uh that's, Matt, that's I guess I will point. let you segue into your point. Well, the point I was going to make, this is just the general D&D &D advice point that I would like a lot of people to understand, particularly those who might be tempted to allow their players to acquire a poorly guarded nuclear weapon. Oh, I never, I, I don't know. What We're not going to bring about. that story up. We're not going to bring that story up. But as a DM, I want you to understand all those who are listening who may one day become DMs or are DMs, do not let your players ruin the campaign for themselves. It is perfectly okay to give players a railroad if it's the only sensible way to save them from the fucking shit show they've dug themselves into. And if it's one play, I will say also, I, I to, to go on that, if yeah, it's yeah. one player, like, I'd say it's Who? more reasonable to focus, to like, if one player is being a, like, a douchebag, and it's trying to like ruin the experience for everyone else. Like, it's okay to punish. Like, if this if your player is like, I'm gonna I'm gonna assassinate this political figure because uh, cause uh, I don't like elves and he's an elf. Yeah, he he goes to jail. 
But like forever. Yes, but as an aside, I actually had an experience with that with one of my players in the Monster Hunter campaign. It was it was Owen. Yeah. Um, Owen was a newer player to D and D, and he didn't actually understand that if he did something dumb like that, it would actually affect the whole party uh-huh. by by association. So just a good point in general. Make sure your players are aware of the consequences of what they're doing. If uh-huh. it's clear what they're doing is going to have some major consequences. It can be fun sometimes when players decide oh. to do it anyways. I also would like to... Sorry. I'm yes, go ahead. I was going to impart a, a, a bit of wisdom onto Jacob and Matt and I guess the audience of how I how I figured out how to do dialogue choices in D&D for mm-hmm. the Star Wars campaign. So basically, obviously you, you, you obviously you can't tell the player like, oh, would you like to say this? Would you like to say this? Or would you like to say the bad thing? Um, so basically mm. what, what, what I do is that I'd, I'd figure out how the, the NPC starts the conversation. And then what I would do is I would say like, if they say within the realms of this, they get light side points. If they get like, like in the, like the neutral kind of grounds, nothing obviously and then like if they're aggressive or hostile then you do you know get the dark side points and then write how that character is going to react to different options and then for i think that's a good choice as well i will say and then um... and then obviously i i would write like the like you know the invest like in, in mass effect you put you press on the left side of the wheel to investigate i would of course um put little things in like do a history check to find about this piece of information or like you know I'd, I'd i'd write that the character would say this and then i would give them the option of using a perception check or whatever and whatnot and then i would also include options for uh like uh like, like you know how in mass effect you have like the dark blue and the like the dark red for like the intimidate and the charm well obviously uh-huh. dnd D, D, D has a intimidate option so you could <laughs> roll an intimidation check to do the intimidation or um uh, you would roll a persuasion check for the the good charm option, or if you have the spell. <clears throat> yeah. Continuing along the same line of player choice, in my Monster Hunter campaign, with the uh, with the prequel, there's no Monster Hunting Guild. The world is overrun by monsters. I decided to do a very interesting thing, since that this was basically just the new world a new world that i was creating from scratch i offered to the players that their player choice of races would become what populates the world the party makeup in other words would be very representative of the world's population not entirely there would be a few extra races here and there but it would absolutely be a major factor for the world's creation and that has led to a lot of really great fun. So, one uh, another big piece of advice going into what I'm explaining here is D and D is cooperative storytelling. It's it's multiple people combining their efforts to create a story. And you know, Sergio, I think you have a good point there, where you you're definitely crafting a narrative, but your narrative is being changed by your players over time. Yeah, and I, I, I did also, because um, in, in a, in a choice-based RPG, obviously it's, it's, it's hard to adapt that to D&D because I write five options and they'll come up with a sixth option. I always make sure to make my options enticing, and I also, you know, do the, you know, if anything in the realm of this happens to prevent them from doing something that I didn't plan for. Yeah, it's... It's very, very, very important to always have contingency plans. Yeah, and for the most part, I didn't have to to, to run with people going off the rails because usually I was a, I was good enough to write liter literally um everything that happens. Uh huh. Which which was good because everyone in our Star Wars party was basically from a completely different background with completely different ideals and goals, but we never really even even if even though we like we had a Sith and a Jedi. They never really conflicted, which I think is a good choice. Yes. Also, I uh, yeah, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I have to use the bathroom, so I will um I'm going to mute myself, and you guys can continue the discussion. Okay. Right. I would I wanted to bring this around to, to my point, which I'd yeah. say is like 
the the fun thing about these kind of campaigns is while you have to do a lot of research into what you like if if you at least if you want it to be super accurate you have to do a lot of research into what is you know right and what is wrong in the system in the or in the universe and like have a basis of the universe but at the same time it's a lot easier and at least in my opinion to base a campaign off of another universe than it is to you have to create your own which is why i think there are so many D D campaigns that are like people write their own campaigns but they base them in places like eberron or all of or like uh the, the wild, created D &D wild amount or wild mount or, or whatever it's called the the roll the roll not roll 20 the fucking uh critical role one that they, now they have their own book people are doing that the forgotten yeah. realms i'd say if you if you base this, uh your campaign in those realms i'd say those count as fan fiction is that fair hmm because way, i guess you because you're not creating the world you are you are quite literally creating a fan fiction even if you just use the map of that universe like of that of of the world in in the forgotten realms or never on you i'd still say because you're creating your adventure and in you're a way, doing though, your own things i would I say that does little... count and that might be getting a little loose, though, because isn't every D and D world technically part of the same universe because of the planes and exist in the dimension systems that they have? Well, I mean, yeah, sure. Well, I guess you could also say to not use those in your campaign. Uh huh. Mm. But like, yeah. even so, like, if I take if my if my campaign takes place in the Forgotten Realms, I'm technically speaking creating a fan work based on the Forgotten Realms. True. True. I can agree with that. Because, like, people who create their own, like, universes for their, or, like, even just worlds for their campaigns, that's awesome. That's so much work, though. You know yeah. I've tried it. Yeah. It's hard work. It's hard work. And that's the big thing, is that if you're, like, like, oh, I have an entire, like, week set out to write this D D campaign with no problems in between. Absolutely doable. But if you're like working or anything really, like it's just so much harder to do that. Which I think is what makes stuff like creating a system in your own like in your own image of a of based on like a fan work. Like, whether it be just like, oh, it's in D&D &D 5e, but it's, uh, Norse mythology. Or that, or it's like, oh, wow, this guy created a 5e conversion for, uh, Star Trek. That'd be fun to run, and then you just base your campaign on the Star Trek world. I think that's easier to do, especially when it comes to stuff that you are already well versed in like obviously matt you play a lot of monster hunter a fair amount yes i watch a lot of 40k stuff i i watch a lot of lore videos i play the tabletop i own the space marine codex for eighth edition and not ninth edition but that's that's beside the point <laughs> but even so even flow pearl jam Yes. Sorry, I got I got triggered by the fucking Game Awards. This is being recorded oh. the day after the Game Awards. Yeah, Game Awards were Woo, fun. I love sucking up Neil Druckmann. Anyways, it's easier because like, yeah, you might need a little bit of like research, like oh, what was going on in the world in like negative eight hundred BBY. But you can look that up. You can look that up. It's not like you're creating, like, the the government is falling apart and is um, doing bad things. Like, stuff like that. It's just, like, there's there's definitely, I don't know specifically about 800, negative 800 BBY, but, like, there's probably, I'll say, some stuff that takes place 
around that time that you can base a story off of, you know? Yeah. Ooh. Bless you. Thank you. A uh, good point about that is you don't always have to stick super close to the canon in fan yeah. fictions in general. If it's something a bit nebulous, I think it's actually very interesting to come up with your own stuff instead of going mm-hmm. with dubious canon. Which especially, is, when um, the, especially when the canon is, is incredibly dubious. Looks at 40k canon. Looks at Homestuck 2. <laughs> oh yeah. Good times. Yes, for anyone who isn't aware, Homestuck 2, as an, as an, in its entirety, is considered dubiously canon. Isn't it written by the same guy? No. He just said, okay, you can make it and I'll make more money off of it. That's so, that's the general gist of Homestuck 2. But uh back on to our to our own topics. Making the campaigns is has been very fun with uh with other people helping to create the story with the player collaboration. That's probably my favorite part of D D as a whole, actually, is just being able to use improv and role playing to make people combine their efforts and develop new things. Uh-huh. And I think that's the, the pure reason why railroading doesn't work most of the time is because you're negating the ability of players to have input in your worlds. And if they don't have input in their world, they can't their character can't grow. And I think that's what you want the most as a player is to have your characters grow. Definitely. Just, just just at least to have them change over back. time. Hey, Serge. We were just talking about, uh, about stuff again. Stuff. Are there any other points that we want to bring up with, uh, with the, the fan campaigns? The fan campaigns, if you will. While you were gone, we talked about how they can be easier to write about. Mm-hmm. Like, because it's not creating a whole universe. Well, um... If you guys didn't talk about what gone, Matt, uh, what was your process for c- creating the Monster Hunter campaign? How did you go about adapting source material? Um, I kind of just made most of it up, to be honest. Going, going on our main point, there's really no, there's not even really a story to Monster yeah. Hunter in general. Yeah, I mean, I guess you had you had less rules to adhere by. Yeah, uh, as far as I'm aware, in Monster Hunter World, the only named character is Geralt in the crossover. That's true. Don't forget Actually about not Mila Jovovich. Mia, Mila Artemis. Jovovich from the, from well, the now, movie. Sh- God, he's in it. Oh, wait, Don't no, forget. Mr. X was in it too, shit. Okay. No, that's, a, that's just a handler, bro. Don't, yeah, that's just a handler. Yeah. Uh, which which technically means that before any other character gets named, Fat Geralt is probably more canon, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> but, um, you know, that made it very easy for me to work off of nothing. I just had to start the, the world over from scratch. As I said earlier, I let the players choose their races, and those races were what became populated in the world. Uh, the races were a normal human. It was... Nick had like three different races, so yeah. his his race kind of dubious. Done weird. His first race, the, the fish people, are definitely in the world. They just haven't become relevant yet. They're just fish. Uh, he had an orc character who's one of the last of his kind, and that has led to some extremely funny but non politically correct breeding jokes being made uh-huh. at the expense of a poor shopkeeper. In the, wor- then, in the uh, words of Nick. I'm here to fuck. Come here. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, top, but, uh, top one phasmophobia moments of 2020. The really it threatens to have sex with a ghost and it leaves. <laughs> the really interesting character was uh, one of my players made a dragon... Is, is it Dragonborn? Yeah. Was... Yeah made a dragonborn character and of course i couldn't just let him be a dragonborn no 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 i had to make his character an abomination of nature if you know what i mean because there are dragons as there are dragon-esque things in monster hunter and uh he's the progeny of one of them 
and that has that has led to a, a whole interesting thing about monsters breeding with people and becoming a uh, main antagonists. And then another guy. Uh, it was a bet, wasn't it? He flipped the coin to see if he would be a normal D and D race or make a cat girl. Yes. And he made a cat girl. <laughs> <laughs> that has surprisingly become one of the uh, the bigger things. Uh, Sergio, you're staticing. I, I can't fix that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we were just letting you know, man. Okay. Chill, yeah, bro. Tone of voice. I can't fix that. I can't fucking fix that. Yeah, deal with it. Ryan Bitch. Johnson looking at the trilogy. <laughs> Anyhow. Ryan Johnson looking at his own script. Um, that's most of the points that I have to make about my own campaign. Jacob talked about his. Is there anything in relation to fandom as a whole we should bring up? Um, don't be afraid of convoluted continuity. If you want to make a Metal Gear Solid campaign, sure. I mean, I, I'm doing a Warhammer 40,000 campaign, and if you know things about the Warhammer 40,000's continuity... It's that nothing is canon, and you shouldn't care. But you also yeah. need to care, because everything is canon. And so, if if you really want to do one like that... Except for Horace, yeah, he's dead. Uh, just, like... What I do, personally, is I, like, look into a lot of theories of, like... What is going on in this certain thing, and I kind of... I kind of make my own decision on what I think is canon based on that, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I like if that. I were to if if I were to be like, I'm I'm going to introduce the Alpha Legion, which I'm not going to. I'd like to state that to my two players that are here right now. I'm disappointed. I'm not gonna introduce the Alpha I'm Legion. I'm not I'm not real I'm not Alpharius this whole Unfortunately. time. Unfortunately. You're a, you're a woman you're not even a space that, marine. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't stop. That doesn't stop the Alpha Legion from disguising themselves. Uh, Magic. Okay, you got me there. But no, if I, if I were to do like, ah, oh, the Alpha Legion's here, then I would have to. It, I it's. I would have to make the decision. Do I want them to be evil, or do I want to go off the theory that Alpha that uh, that Omegon, Alpharius Omegon, uh, is kind of a good guy in his own weird twisted fucked up way and so i as the dm can instead of just being like oh i don't know what to do i just would do what i like more what i think would be better for a plot is what i would choose and i think that's something that you should think about and stick by if you want to do something like this if there are like continuity issues in your in, in your series that you want to make something off of and you're like, oh golly, Borderlands 3 sure has ruined the fucking lore of the Sirens for the Borderlands campaign tabletop system that Jake has been working on for three years! <laughs> Just do what you think is the most fun, you know? Yeah, also Borderlands campaign coming soon, TM. Maybe, if I it's work on out. it. Shut up! Why don't you fucking work on it, see how you like it. Don't tempt him. I, uh... Um, you get it done in two weeks. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess we can, uh, uh, discuss, um, uh, uh, my, my, my Sentai campaign in regards to homebrewing things for your, uh, your own campaigns. Because I know, uh, you know, obviously not a lot of conversions for everything work. Um, well, there's not a conversion for everything that you want. Usually there is one, but usually there's not. So, how I, how I, how I went about for my, um, campaign is, uh, there, there is, there is a Sentai system out there. It's called Henshin. Um, they've got a Patreon. Um, I think, like, the base rule book is free, and you gotta pay for, like, modules and adventures. But my problem with Henshin is that it wasn't, like... It didn't have, like, the in-depthness that I was, like, looking for. It was really kind of, like, simple. So I decided was, to go with... It was a fairly surface-level module. Yeah, it was a very, very surface-level system in, in general. So I decided to go with something tried and true, D&D 5th edition. Best thing ever. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, so, you know, I, I got the foundation started. And then... Um, 
uh, base. So, uh, so you know, I got the foundation, I'm going to do D&D, D&D 5th edition, and then I start building the world. Uh, I, that's, that's usually what I, what I, what I usually do first. I start by building the world, uh, for this. That's crazy. For, 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 for this campaign, I started with, um, I guess I worked my way backwards. I started with the villains, um, using, uh, using the, um, a template from a certain Sentai season called Go Kaiger. So basically what, what the character archetypes I created was the, the big, bad, evil villain, you know, sits on his chair for the whole series and gets up off his ass in the last five episodes and kicks the hero's asses, but they win the day. So we got evil space emperor. Um, then we needed the the evil scientist that makes the monsters grow. So we got, her name is Nebulaea. She's horrible. Um, then you got the big strong dude. Um, like the, like the, the, the big strong champion who's got a rivalry usually with one of the rangers. And that became, I believe his name is... Uh, I did know his name. He's only appeared like once, but I can't, I can't think of it at the moment. It's not the dragon guy. Is it? No, no, it, it, he 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 works he works for he works for Nexion. He's like he 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 you, you met him, but I can't remember his name. He's like a big hulking dude. I'm sure I'm sure. If Album I... Ita. Album Ita, yes, that was his name. Yeah. Um, and then we have like the, the map to remember. The 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 second the dairy kind of like Starscream esque villain who's like a schemer and he's a plotter. He kind of takes over as the main villain for like middle of the series usually in the season, and that is uh, Nexion Andromedon, and he's a dragon man. And then we need I needed to have the uh, um like the 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 roguish evil ranger type, and that became a mercenary by the name of Magnus. So I had the I had the villains. I had the tiers of the mooks that I went with the rangers. And for the rangers, they didn't start with class features. They were just kind of basic fighter-type-esque characters. The, the class features came later because I was very much building this system by the seat of my pants. <sighs> and one of one of the things that I, I want to absolutely make sure to include that ballooned into its own thing was the concept of uh, uh, the, pow- the power-ups. Um, so I invented the Stellar Marble system, which, um, again, to this moment, is still being built up uh, over time. Basically, um, on a, your normal D&D turn, instead of attacking, uh, in sort of like, like a vein of using magic, you can use a Stellar Marble that come in various varieties. There are Support Marbles, which do healing, they cast buffs. These don't take an action, they take a bonus action. There are Attacking-based Marbles that obviously function as an attack and take the place of an attack option. And then there are passive marbles that do passive effects uh, to the person, more AC uh, resistances to certain things. And then we have um, weapon enchantments, which which basically upgrade and improve um, uh, the person's base weapon. I had started out upgrading their power weapons, but I had come to the conclusion that I, I was making the, the base weapon too strong and then making um uh the, the, then with the weapon enchantments is getting too crazy so I capped them off at like three for their uh, their main weapon which was my latest I, I call them patch notes where I where I announce to everyone that they're getting nerfed hard um usually I usually don't buff people it's usually all nerf because I usually <laughs> don't realize things the scope too overpowered of what I I do. Because a lot of the stuff we do in that system is like, like one of us comes along and we're like, "Hey, hey Sergio," and you're like, "Yeah," and we're like, "Oh, I had an idea for a power up." Because uh, I, 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 it does seventeen d nineteen damage, and it has a minimum. Uh, if you roll anything below a, a an eighteen on the d nineteen, you do twenty damage instead, and it also makes everything die. And you're just like, "That sounds cool." Because I, 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 I use it a, for like two sessions. I, I have a crafting system which is extensive. There's over Very. like there's almost a there's there's at least fifty plus ingredients. Uh, and my my rule is is that that you can craft any stellar marble that you want as long as it falls within the confines of what I have set up for those ingredients. So so and usually I have an ingredient for every kind of category so I can. They tell me what they want, and then 
I I make up the marble from the recipe and then they can craft it and you can upgrade marbles um, up to level three and then you can upgrade their tier and then they can be leveled up again. This required me to, of course, nerf the marble down so higher levels weren't getting too ridiculous. Um, I have very specific formulas for calculating things. Um, for example, I have what are called stellar attacks, which is um, for, let's say you're playing a caster ranger um, that I've, I've basically made is that there are magic rangers that instead of getting multi-attack, like a, an attack, like a, like a ranger that's focused on melee, they get multiple spell casts. So if they don't want to do dexterity or strength for their power weapon, they can do intelligence, which is the general thing for, um, magic damage. So I give them stellar attacks, which are basically stellar marbles that you can use infinitely as your, in place of your attack. And if I remember correctly, the, uh, the formula for that is, I believe it's, ooh, actually, hold on, let me pull it up, because I believe, I believe it's 1d12 plus intel, yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's usually like, like, like a, like a 1d8 plus something plus half level times half of your, uh, your, uh, int modifier. It it, 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 it was just half level times modifier, but uh, somebody decided to crank up their intelligence to eight, and I realized how ridiculous that was. So it's, so it's now half level times half modifier. Thanks, Matt. Very cool. Hey, I told you that my Hydra's Bite would get out of hand, and you were like, nah, it looks fine. And then, uh, yeah, Matt had a, had a, had a Hydra's Bite marble, uh, that, uh, it, it started out, like, like, three times and upgrade to four times, but I was upgrading the, the damage on it instead of just keeping the number going up, and then he kept adding more and more passive damage. I kept adding more intelligence and all that so it just it just got too much yeah so i just lowered the base i just nerfed the base damage it on uh, to hell so he could have his extra damage on it and not have it be um so overpowered be completely insane and then yeah. and then also I'm to add I'm back to, sorry to, to add to add fuel to, to matt's decreasing fire i started making em and enemies resist that marble specific type of damage <laughs> I still do probably more damage than the rest of the party, though, which is a testament to how obscene that marble was in the first place. Yeah, and while, while I haven't had a long enough session for certain builds to, to, to be swapped out to fight different enemies, uh, the, 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 the thing is still there. Like, if you wanted to make a ranger in my system that just casted... Like that was just debuff, debuff heaven or buff heaven. That that is that is that is an option. You can be an attacker. You can be a melee. It's really like blossomed into a true RPG build system. Because I I yeah, I, it's pretty impressive. I I imagine D and D as like a turn based RPG. Um, uh, and I I was kind of running it that way with the uh, um rangers attacking first. But that didn't end up working well because that that system started out to be broken a little bit. We would just kill things too fast. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, I, I think we should start to wrap it up. By the way, just yeah, but, I've worked. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just uh, so so you know, stellar marbles um was one of the things I had to make for that, and I I I, I crafted a I I mean I I made a bunch of them. I made the system. Uh, then, of course, I had to make uh, Zord combat. Um, so, it, the Zords are basically just beefy D&D &D characters, and they work a very specific way. And, uh, like, they have the individual Zords that can fight themselves, and then the Megazord, they all do a certain thing. They, like, like they each have something th that they can do in the, the Zord. Like, one person activates the shields, one person scans the enemy for weaknesses, one person actually attacks... Um, like, they get an attack of each arm, and then they have s spell slots that do, like, the different things. So it's not just one per- it was, for one, but one person controlled the, the Zord and made the attack roll. But now it's a- it's, it's literally, like, a- like a five-person job to run the Megazord. Yeah. And then, of course, for the Crisis, um, I had to, uh, 
that that allowed me to do some fun things because I could bring in like Star Wars classes with the the Star Wars characters jumping in, um, and then bring things like Persona. The Persona user, if you can find it on the D and D wiki, class is a very fun class to play. Um, a Persona campaign using it would be very fun, but that was one of the things I, I like that I liked to get to do. And just simply having to convert certain characters over to D and D and figuring out how they would work while still being true to who they who they were and how they worked. I have to leave, so if you guys want to wrap it up while I leave. Yeah. Sorry. Sure. I have to leave sooner than I thought. All right. Do you want me to just do, you want me to just do the wrap up now? Uh yeah, let's just wrap up now. Okay. Uh. You can you can you can just cut this part of the conversation out of the episode. Uh, and that's, I think that's all the time we have for now. Uh, come back next week, and we'll, uh, be back to our regularly scheduled, uh, bullshit. We'll be having a story from our wonderful Matthew here. Yeah, so it will be one, one fun It ride. will be one story to remember, just one. Yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed our rambling for half an hour. Yes. Sorry if it, I was just droning on about my accomplishments. Oh, so many accomplishments. Yeah. All right, see you guys next week. Bye.